So it's early in the morning and I'm trying to get my piece laid out. I have my mountains and I've cut along the top of them about half an inch or between half an inch and three eighths of an inch away from the top of the mountains. I'll stitch and trim somewhere along here. And then underneath I've put some lavender fabric that I've turned upside down because I like the back layer of mountains to be faded and you know it's it's more art than science and so I'm using scraps and uh, sometimes I allow these to go where they're not on grain this piece of fabric is on grain uh, these are sort of diagonal when I'm stitching those I'll be careful to try to control my fabric so that I'm not allowing this bias to cause me to accidentally stretch my piece out and that's where the basting comes in and some other things and you get good at controlling that. I've also planted a layer of fairly wide band of cream colored sparkly fabric. I like to have a band of white behind the mountains and then I've planted this scrap of a light blue sky fabric and then a uh, big piece of this sort of a batik fabric and then this is just a little silver polka dot and so I just I've done this a lot and you'll want to experiment with the fabrics you have uh, you can see up in the corner the piece that I'm sort of mimicking that I've made in the past and you just kind of play with it and once you get these layered in, you know, you're going to try to stitch in a way that utilizes them. You don't want to waste too much, but on the other hand, if you don't have something planted under there, you don't really have much to work with in terms of your design. And so I'm just going to keep adding fabrics and see what I can accomplish. In general, I would say that I have the fewest fabrics now that had in a very long time, which is by design. I'm, I'm not sure. Uh, I've been trying to use up a lot of my fabrics and not, not really replace them. So here is a nice, uh, very linty, light fabric. I like to think in terms of having the rich sky with some light stuff behind the mountains. The mountains I want to be very rich and then I like that uh, landscape under the mountains usually to be fairly light and have some interest going on. I like the foreground to be very rich. I'm going to heat up my iron to iron this one. If you've ever done any uh, watercolor quilting, that experience of figuring out the various values of fabric will come in handy with this kind of thing. Some landscape quilters go so far as to break down their pattern, uh, similar to what you look at when you do a paint-by-number painting and assign a fabric to each value and then uh, cut out each piece using fusible. I prefer a freer process than that, but if you're interested in that kind of quilting, I'm sure there are books and other things out there. Uh, quilting Arts Magazine, for instance, probably uh, can get you started on some ideas on how to do that. As I'm doing this, I'm worried that this is too strong a pattern for what I'm doing, and so I'm going to keep an eye on that and make sure that I want to allow that to show. I may just have it in there so that there's that nice fringe along the edge, but mostly cover it with other fabrics. I just don't like my fabrics, my bands, to be too straight because then you can unless you're going for that type of a look, you can easily end up with your landscape just having bands of color and 
I like it to have a little bit more variation. And I just keep working on this. I just keep adding it. I just keep layering in some colors of fabrics that I think will look nice. I save my scraps for the next piece. I'm missing some of the great fabrics I used to have, I'll tell ya. This kind of landscape quilting does waste fabric. It's not frugal. It's good for me to just consider how I like the colors. Um, I sure miss that fabric with the, the green and red mottled areas, that batik. To me, it looked a lot like flowers in the ground, and that's how I used it, but I don't have that anymore. I'm not sure I like that fabric in there. It creates a little bit of a camo effect that I'm not wanting. I don't know if this fatigue can give me the look of some uh, orange flowers in the foreground. That would be nice. So I'm going to try it. And then what I do is I make three rows of pins. And then I take it to my machine and I put the washable thread into the bobbin and I stitch it with usually black thread in the top so that it's very easy to see and I rip that out as I go. I've shown it before in other videos and uh, the wash away on the back if it gets very quilted into the pattern will wash out for me. And so I'm going to be pinning this, and I like to just keep smoothing it. So the middle is the hardest part. I do it last, and I just try to kind of fold my edges in on both sides so that I can push through and pull pins as I go, because it's many machines, it's bad for them to drive over a pin. Try to let the feed dogs feed the material so that you're not creating a lot of extra movement in your fabric. I could hear my needle hitting on that paint as it went through. I don't know if it will uh, play in the video, but um, sometimes when you quilt a lot you can get to where you can hear the sound of a dull needle hitting your fabric. I swear to you it's true. So here it is. I've shown a lot of these things before. It's important for you to just pull out your stash and work with the color scheme that you're comfortable with and think about just like you did if you did the color wash uh, piecing for one of the purses. This will require a leap of faith for you to lay something out and have it ready to stitch uh, for next time. I did want to take a second to give one more plug to the website and issue a call for uh, pictures of viewer projects, anything that was somehow inspired uh, by the videos on the channel. I'd love to see your work and I'd love to post it on that page where I want to collect just pictures of things. Some people have sent things to me already and I would love to see more. Thanks.